welcome everyone. We're just gonna give it a few minutes for everyone to trickle in. All right, welcome. Um, this is the Climate Forward Ambassadors webinar on transportation solutions. Um, I think we'll have a few more people joining us, but I just wanna get started because we have a lot to cover in just one hour. Um, before I start sharing my screen, I just wanted to introduce everyone who's on the call today. So my name is Hannah Payne. I'm the Climate Change Program Manager with the City of Somerville in the Office of Sustainability and Environment, and I lead the Ambassadors Program. Um, and we're joined this evening by some of my amazing colleagues from the city. Um, so I'll let them all introduce themselves. Um, and we have two presentations tonight um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So Brad, do you wanna introduce yourself quickly? Sure, Hannah, thanks so much. Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Brad Rawson. I'm a Somerville resident and I serve the city as director of mobility in Mayor Joe Curtitoni's Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. My team works in close partnership with Hannah Vital and Oliver and with all of you as our residents and stakeholders to try to achieve our climate plan's commitment to decarbonize transportation in our fair city in just a couple of short decades. I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks. Oliver, you want to go next? Hi, everyone. Um, nice. I would say nice to see you again, but I can't see you. So at the next meeting, it'll be nice to see you. Oliver Sellers Garcia. I'm the director of the Office of Sustainability and Environment. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to again meet you. Uh, this is uh, Vital Deshpande. I'm environmental program manager uh, for Office of Sustainability and Environment for the city. Thank you. Great. Thanks all. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, let's see, kick things off. Um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna talk all about transportation tonight and um, the different strategies that we have to reduce transportation emissions in Somerville. So um, we've got an hour this evening. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction. Then Brad is going to give a presentation about a lot of our mobility strategies and how that is, um, how his team kind of works on our climate priorities. And then I'll talk um, about what we're doing around electric vehicles. And we'll have time at the end for Q&A. So if along the way you have questions about the presentations um, or things you wanna know about transportation, things we're not covering that you still have questions about, please type those into the Q&A box. There should be one um, on your screen and we'll get to those at the end. Um, and just a heads up, we are recording this um, webinar and we'll be posting it on the city's YouTube page, Somerville Gov TV uh, once uh, afterwards. So um, with that, what are we gonna talk about this evening? Um, so many of you are already familiar with Somerville Climate Forward, our climate action plan. In the plan, there are 13 priority actions um, and two of those are focused on transportation. The first is really focused on equitable, low carbon mobility. So this is all things related to getting people out of their cars, onto bikes, buses, public transit, walking, um, all of that. The second strategy is, is acknowledging that many of us need to use our cars um, at some time. And um, in order to have net zero emissions, we need to make those vehicle trips um, have net zero emissions. So the way we do that is by electrifying vehicles. So just a quick reminder of where um, Somerville's greenhouse gas emissions come from. This is a profile of our community greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a third of our emissions come from the transportation sector and almost all of those are coming from car and truck trips. Um, when we zoom out to look at the US, um, so this data is from the EPA and it's 2018 data of the US greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is a huge part of our uh, national emissions with at about 28%. So this is the largest category um, in the US is from transportation. Um, so really important to address this both in Somerville and nationwide. 
when you zoom into where those transportation emissions come from in the US, um, nearly 60% are from light duty vehicles. So that's really the sweet spot for electrification, um, but also the sweet spot for changing those trips to another mode. So getting people onto trains and buses and biking and walking, um, all of those things. Um, so those are just giving you some context of when we're talking about transportation, um, why it's so critical to, um, why it's such a critical part of all of our climate strategies. So with that, I wanna pass things over to Brad. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and he should be able to share his screen. Unless he walked away for a moment. Brad, are you there? Sure am, Hannah. Okay. <laughs> Success. Can you give me a confirmation that you can see everything well, Hannah? It looks good, Brad. Thanks, Oliver. Okay, again, thanks everybody. I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day, out of your routine to participate in the great civic experiment of local governance in Somerville. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name's Brad. I'm a Somerville resident. I live in far west Somerville near North Street. I'm a Somerville parent. My little guy's gonna enter our fantastic public school system in the fall. Um, and I've been a part of this community for coming up on 14 years now. I've been a community planner for 20 years now. The role that I play in our city administration is leading up the city's efforts to um, you know, really achieve the goals in our community-based plans like Climate Forward, but also in others like the city's Vision Zero Plan, which commits us to ending crashes, eliminating crashes that result in severe injuries and fatalities on our streets, uh, implementing our summer vision plans to have density without driving, to help us achieve our goals of affordable housing, social equity, tax-based diversification, open and green space provision, and make sure that we can have a transit-focused smart growth program in this city. So tonight we'll be talking primarily about our strategies of low carbon mobility and a couple of things that you know, I really want you to kind of keep in mind as we go through this quick little slide deck here is that as Hannah said, you know, 35% of our footprint here in Somerville is coming primarily from the tailpipes of the motor vehicles that we as residents or our neighbors as business owners and employees operate, right? Motor vehicle trips that start or end in four little square miles of this motor, uh, of this metro area, account for more than 200,000 metric tons of carbon entering the atmosphere every year. How are we gonna get that to zero? It's gonna take time. It's gonna take vision. It's going to take bold action. It's going to take steps that are often unpopular. And that's part of the value of a webinar like tonight's. It's to ask you all to tighten your belts, roll up your sleeves, and work as part of an empathetic and diverse coalition of stakeholders here to recognize that transition is hard, but that our planet won't wait and our people won't wait either. So three major priority areas, as Hannah mentioned. Um, the first one is about bus transit. And it's very funny to me when I speak with folks from around the region and around the country, they always think of Somerville in the story of the orange line getting extended in 1975 to Sullivan Square, um, of the red line getting extended to West Somerville in the mid eighties, or of the incredible successes we've had generating the new orange line station in assembly in 2014, first one in 30 years, mind you, uh, in the Commonwealth, or the green line extension, um, which has taken 40 years for our community to, you know, really advocate for and ultimately achieve. And that light transit system is gonna open up for service uh, less than a year from now, it's incredible. But I think of us as a bus community. There are about 16,000 bus trips that start in Somerville every weekday in normal pre-COVID conditions. So we are a city of bus riders and that's a great thing. And yet transit is having a tough couple of years here, even before the COVID crisis. 
Nationally and regionally, bus ridership was flat or declining, and many of Somerville's 14 bus routes were exhibiting that type of trend line. The research shows that people will not tolerate unreliable bus service, that improvements in reliability in schedule adherence generate ridership. And one of the really cool things that I've enjoyed about the last five or six years of service and of learning in Somerville is that we can't sit around throwing rocks at the MBTA for buses that don't run on time and for residents, visitors, and workers who choose not to take the bus and instead invest their time, their money, uh, or their carbon emissions in motor vehicle travel. It's not just the MBTA's fault, folks. They can have a million buses and a million operators, but if they're stuck in traffic, they're not gonna be on time and people aren't going to choose to use them. The power to free the bus and get it out of traffic rests primarily in the hands of municipal governments. And that's why I'm so proud of the work that my team has been doing, the leadership that Mayor Joe has provided, the partnership with our city council and our grassroots activists who have had our back when we've done unpopular and risky things like the Winter Hill Busway in 2019. This project generated transformative ridership changes. The statistics that you show are apples to apple statistics prior to COVID. And it showed that when we started to achieve on-time performance improvements, we're getting a thousand extra riders per day on Route 89. That's incredible, especially when you look at it in the context of the last slide of the declining numbers on many of these really, really important bus routes. So it's not just about the bus lane. If there's a takeaway that I want folks to, on this call to, to, to have, it's that it's a bigger series of tools. Rolling out the red carpet is perhaps the most visible, the most iconic and controversial. There are a series of other steps that cities can take uh, to make the bus run on time. Stop consolidation is one of them, and it has its own challenges. On average, the MBTA uh, and transit na uh, agencies nationwide strive for a stop frequency in urban environments of every quarter mile, maybe every 900 linear feet. But often in communities like Somerville, you see stops that occur literally every three or 400 feet. And folks uh, who ride the bus regularly in Somerville can probably imagine on their experience and their route, wait a second, we just had a stop. Why are we stopping another block down? when you actually consolidate stops like we did in the Winter Hill neighborhood, uh, that saves time and improves reliability. Traffic signal infrastructure is another really important part of the recipe for success with bus prioritization. And our project on Broadway was able to leverage that. So that traffic signal that you see in this photo uh, at the School Street intersection was outfitted with technology that is kind of similar to what we use for our first responders. Next time you see an ambulance or a fire truck come in through a signalized intersection, if you look closely, I'll see if I can mouse over it, there's a little infrared detector on the signal mast arm. And when it detects a beam that is emitted from that emergency vehicle, it will essentially freeze the signal up uh, and preserve that green light so the first responder can get where she or he need to go. We're investing in, uh, in technologies that do the same for the bus, hold that green light a little bit longer truncate the red a little bit earlier um, because seconds matter and they cascade throughout the day. Literally when you save a bus one minute of runtime at 9 a.m. in the morning, the domino effect of schedule adherence proceeds through the rest of the day. How can you help accelerate change in this program? Some of us in a regional leader in this space, but we're not the only ones. We're learning from our peers and our neighbors. The city of Everett has actually been the regional leader and they have been trailblazers in bus prioritization. And so what we have, I often describe as a friendly sibling rivalry, a benevolent or positive sibling rivalry where Everett sets the bar with a terrific project in 2016 or 2017. In Somerville, we delivered our first one in 2017 down in our Union Square neighborhood. Uh, the Broadway project was 2019. City of Boston comes back and does a big, great project in 2019. And now we try to move the needle again. So we are all learning from one another and pushing one another. But it's so important to communicate to our stakeholders what we are doing, why, where, and how you can be involved to get educated 
to help us with the observations that you have as residents, as stakeholders, as bus customers. On the left side of your screen, you see a couple of projects that we implemented last year. The first one is in our Davis Square neighborhood, very short, few jump lanes uh, for Route 89, uh, and for Route 94 and 96 on College Avenue, uh, for Route 87, 88, and 89 on Holland Street. This was a short-term pilot project that will actually be built in concrete and with higher quality repaving this coming construction season. Uh, just like any project that our team does, we have a variety of stakeholders with a variety of perspectives about uh, street design. And if you are interested in learning more and being part of the community dialogue uh, and supporting our team's sometimes controversial work in this space, uh, there's a little web link below there uh, on our summer voice page. We anticipate a community meeting this spring. The second image is an experiment in a pilot project that we implemented serving Route 86 uh, near the Argenziano School in our Duck Village in Lincoln Park neighborhood, uh, coming out of Union Square and headed towards Beacon Street. Route 86 is the highest ridership bus in Somerville. Um, and we were so excited to work with local stakeholders to design and implement a series of bus, pedestrian, and bicycle safety improvements. Again, as a temporary measure until the city is able to come in and repave the streets, rebuild the sidewalks, upgrade traffic signal equipment a couple of years from now. Uh, and in the short term, we're freeing the bus, we're speeding it up. And folks, this is really important in the context of COVID-19. Although ridership is down tremendously, it's coming back. And for, for people who do not have the luxury of working from home and who continue to use the MBTA bus service every day, it's our responsibility as public safety officials to try to make those buses run on time so you don't have undue crowding circumstances. Bus lanes help. This year, our residents can get excited about a couple of big flagship projects in the East Somerville and Winter Hill neighborhoods. The third image is at the Washington Street underpass where you have three different really important bus lines, Route 86, Route CT2, and Route 91. All three of them will benefit from a new dedicated bus facility at the Washington Street underpass and then a couple of other related ones that are not uh, visible in this photo. Interestingly, the Green Line extension will be delivering light rail service at this location later this year, knock on wood. And the idea of having a seamless, dignified, reliable bus transfer to the light rail, as well as the community path extension, which is gonna run right across the top of the Washington Street Bridge and bring the user down onto the sidewalk level here. We're gonna have protected bike lanes, dedicated bus lanes, and really start to build a reliable mobility hub for our residents and for the entire region here in East Somerville. And last but not least, in a couple of short weeks, we'll be painting dedicated bus lanes on State Highway 38, also known as Mystic Avenue, in our Winter Hill and Ten Hills neighborhood. And I highlight this project because I mentioned a few minutes ago that municipalities need to show leadership and courage to dedicate right of way that historically has only been made available to private motor vehicles uh, with all of the social and environmental implications that we understand, costs $10,000 a year for the average summer, uh, the average Massachusetts household to own and operate a motor vehicle. Um, and yet we historically have dedicated all of our right of way to moving motor vehicle traffic with residual space left over for people walking, wheeling, riding bikes and riding the bus. And although municipalities have really started doing the hard work of dedicating streets that they control to bus lanes, we actually haven't seen as much traction with state agencies, which is why we're so excited about this Mystic Avenue project. Mystic Ave is under the care and control of MassDOT and has taken a lot of advocacy, including grassroots advocacy from folks like you to get our state agency partners to say their roads should focus on moving people, not just moving cars. It's a very different paradigm. So for the second portion of this short little um, elevator pitch and, and mini presentation, uh, I'd like to focus on bicycle mobility. So for longtime residents, hopefully you have seen the same thing that I have seen, which is you know, really impressive growth in the network of bike facilities on Somerville streets over time. We have so much work to do still, and yet we've made great progress over the course of the last 15 years. This graph shows um, that we've added you know, a couple dozen miles of dedicated bike facilities around the city. And you'll notice that Sharrow's shared lane markings are excluded from this graph. They are not bicycle infrastructure. 
it is the law in Massachusetts that any bicycle rider can use any travel lane and have a legal right to be there. But research shows that the more separation and the more comfort you can provide, the more diverse and large scale group of stakeholders will choose to use biking as a mode of travel, not just for recreation, but for commuting, for errand running. And so you've seen a real emphasis now in these dedicated and separated bike facilities. Um, community path extension is going to be transformative, but we need a useful, redundant network through every Somerville neighborhood um, so that parents can let their kids be free range and trust that they're gonna have a safe and reliable way to get around on their bikes. Um, that people of color, women and seniors are comfortable because research shows that on street bike lanes traditionally serve young white and male users in a much more reliable fashion and that other more diverse user groups uh, really benefit from and disproportionately use protected bike infrastructure. So that's why the Somerville Climate Forward Plan, which tries to lead with equity, um, really emphasizes the importance of not just standard bike lanes, but protected and separated bike lanes. Bike share is another important part of the toolkit. This slide is intended to show how even uh, when people don't have you know, bicycle ownership or their commute patterns, their travel patterns don't involve bringing their bike everywhere every day, publicly owned bike share, uh, the regional blue bike system is another important indicator of the progress that we are making by making our streets safer and more inviting. And so the green line in this graph is our 2020 performance. We are on track to outpace even 2019. We're just getting lots and lots of trip starts. We've got about three dozen blue bike stations in Somerville. It is a part of the regional transit network and really deserves to be thought of as such. Uh, but it's so exciting to see more and more people choosing to use the blue bike system. It is so convenient. Uh, the vehicles are reliable and they're in every Somerville neighborhood. What does this all mean for tailpipe emissions? What's the means to the end? You know, we are seeing historic travel patterns change. Uh, we are seeing you know, places that we have regular traffic counters over time, um, that traffic counts are actually decreasing. And that may actually feel counterintuitive to you. We all like to complain about traffic and we should. It has the risk of harming us and it has the risk of chronic health exposure and long-term health impacts uh, from particulate matter emissions from the tailpipes. When you actually look at all these locations, uh, you start to see a general downward trend. But it's not an accident, folks. There's a principle in our industry called induced demand. When you make it easy to do something, people do it. So for example, when you widen a freeway, people think it's going to be relieving congestion. The science is in. It's quite the opposite. The new lane on the freeway is filled up within a year or two. Study after study have shown this dynamic. One of the things I've been really pleased about our team's work in Somerville over the years is that we've been able to measure the success of our transportation programs, our safety measures, our bus lanes and bike lane programs. This slide shows you just a representative selection of projects where we have intentionally redesigned our streets, often using very low cost and nimble materials of paint, flex posts and signage to try to make the sustainable choice, the equitable choice, the easy choice. And the thing that we find is that people don't drive there as much. It's the inverse of induced demand. People will stay on the freeway perhaps. Uh, if they don't have to come to Somerville, maybe they will choose to drive somewhere else. The result is cleaner air, less risk of crash, a more pleasant environment, a less noisy environment. And so uh, just a few examples here of, you know, if you build it, they will come. You build bike and bus lanes, safe and accessible walking routes. Um, you get the kinds of mobility that our climate plan calls on us to deliver. Cautionary tale, ride hailing has been sometimes characterized by the ride hailing industry as a way to reduce tailpipe emissions. And again, the science is coming in now with three or five years worth of experience around the country and locally. So it's simply not true. Uh, ride hailing as an industry is adding the equivalent of a Highland Avenue or a Temple Street worth of traffic to Somerville every day. 10,000 every you know, motor vehicle trips um, are increasing because of ride hailing. Um, so you know, please be cautious when you think of it. It has it as a tool and like any tool, it can be used for good reasons or for bad reasons. But we need to recognize that empty trips 
We call them deadheads when uh, you know drivers are driving around without a fare. Um, that clutters up our streets uh, and that adds to the burden of motor vehicle use in our city. I think that's about the end of my presentation, Hannah. So why don't I turn it back over to you? I'll be delighted to answer questions as best I can. I hope this was a little bit of an interesting preview for folks. And if you'd like to learn more, um, Google Somerville Mobility Division, you can find our, our, our team's homepage. Um, Summer Voice, the public engagement platform that we primarily use for many of our projects. And folks, we need you. People who disagree with the low carbon mobility policies and projects that we implement raise their voices. I've had the unique privilege of having people stand on street corners with signs that say, fire that guy. I've been yelled at a million times in public meetings because we challenge the status quo. I believe that our mayor, that our city council, and that you, our residents and stakeholders, are asking us to challenge the status quo. But when you push the status quo, it pushes back. We need you to have our back to continue to deliver on the promise of the Climate Forward Agenda. Thanks very much. Thanks, Brad. That was great. You covered so much um, of the amazing work that you and your team are doing. Um, so if anyone has questions for Brad, put them in the chat and we'll get to them afterwards. But now I am going to uh, switch gears and talk about personal vehicles um, and how we can reduce the emissions from them. So I think Brad did an excellent job framing kind of our um, overall strategy around transportation emissions in Somerville Climate Forward. And that is first to, you know, really prioritize building um, infrastructure that supports um, improving quality of life and getting around and making it easier for people who um, don't have access to a car to get around um, and, and meet their needs. So starting with that, um, but then really understanding that cars, um, you know, we're not going to get away from our dependency on cars tomorrow or even in the next you know, 30 years, um, it's gonna be a real challenge and there's gonna be a lot of work to do to kind of get us off of that. Um, and so electric vehicles and electrifying vehicle fleets remains a really important part of our strategy to reduce emissions. Um, and there are benefits to that you know, from the climate perspective as well as for reducing um, uh, air pollution and improving air quality and things like that. So before I dive into going deeper on um, electric vehicles, I just want to share a few quick definitions um, in case you're unfamiliar with these and I will probably use them in my presentation and I want to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, so first is EV, short for electric vehicles. EVSE um, is short for electric vehicle supply equipment, which is I think just a really jargony way of saying charging stations. Um, there are three main types of, of electric vehicle charging stations. First is referred to as level one. Um, and this is a pretty slow charge. So if you have a um, electric vehicle and you plug your charging cable into a regular outlet um, that's 120 volts, that's what would be a level one charge. And you get about four miles per hour um, of charge with this level of station. This works for a lot of residential um, charging. So if you're able to park your car overnight and plug it in, this works really well for that. The next is level two. Um, so this is like plugging into a 240 volt outlet. Um, you get about 10 to 25 miles per hour of charge. Um, and so, you know, you can get your car charged in a few hours, depending on the size of the battery um, and the, the ability of like the rate that the car can charge. Um, so a few hours to either get fully charged or to get a decent amount of charge that you can drive a lot. Um, so this is what our public charging stations are. Um, they're all level two. Um, so giving you, you know, a decent charge in a few hours. Then the last is DCFC or direct current fast charging. This is, gives you the fastest charge and it's about 30 minutes for a full charge. And so this is what you'll typically see in like a highway, uh, rest stop, or um, I think the most common ones people are familiar with are the like Tesla um, superchargers are these fast chargers. And we currently don't have any of these in Somerville. So those are some definitions. So, okay, 
So now we're, we're shifting gears and we're gonna talk about what does EV charging look like in a city like Somerville? So based on research from the Department of Energy, they estimate that over 80% of EV charging happens at a driver's residence. And if we're in person, I would uh, ask you all who has off street parking um, in Somerville. We know that's like a premium there and a lot of people rely on on street parking to park their cars. That makes EV charging really challenging in a city. Um, or if you do have off street parking, you're likely in a multifamily building where you might not have easy access to an outlet, um, et cetera. The, and when we look at kind of, you know, we've been doing a lot of work in our office to understand kind of where EV charging policy is going, what does the market look like? And for the most part, a lot of the work to date has really been focused on um, the suburban single family homeowner um, EV driver where the expectation is that you can easily drive home, park your car after work, charge up overnight, and you really only need charging for those long distance trips. So you might hear a lot about range anxiety. So for example, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Biden's new infrastructure plan proposal. Even this morning on the news, I was hearing, you know, oh, range anxiety is one of the main driver, uh, things that prevents people from choosing an EV. So we're gonna invest in EV charging. Um, that's a bit different in a city, right? If you don't have a place to reliably charge your car overnight, it's not necessarily range anxiety that's preventing you from doing that. It's, you still won't even have the ability to, you know, make a short trip to drop off your kid at daycare or go to a doctor's appointment, um, those types of things. So we need to think differently about what our strategies are for, um, building up the infrastructure for charging. And so that's why in the climate plan, we really focus on infrastructure above all else for um, enabling the transition to EVs. Um, and then finally, 65% of Somerville households rent. And so, um, you know, even if you do rent and you do have an off street parking spot, um, you may not have access to a, a reliable safe outlet that you could plug into. Um, and you may not have the ability to convince your landlord to make an upgrade to be able to let you charge your car at home. So there are a number of barriers that we um, recognize and need to address if we are going to try to make um, EV access as um, equitable as possible. And we understand that the price of EVs is out of, out of range for many people, um, but those prices are coming down. And so in anticipation of that, how do we make sure that we're setting ourselves up so that all of our um, all folks will be able to access that the benefits of EV um, ownership. Okay, um, so what this looks like in cities and especially in Somerville is more reliance on public charging. So um, we have a network of public charging stations throughout the city. Um, there, this is a map of where they're located of our active stations. Um, and we continue to try to expand this as, as much as possible. This year we added stations at Assembly and um, at the ice rink down on Somerville Ave. Um, these stations serve, we've, we had about a thousand unique users in 2020 who used these stations. So, you know, folks in Somerville, visitors, um, all, all types are charging their vehicles at these stations. Um, but we know that this is not sufficient for meeting the, the needs of today nor the needs of tomorrow. So we did some research to understand um, what, what should we be planning for? You know, EVs and the infrastructure needed for them, this is all very new. So what do we need to be planning for um, for this transition? So we looked at a couple scenarios. Um, the first that we looked at was this low scenario. So the blue one at the bottom, um, this was looking at based on data we had of uh, EV purchases um, made in a few years um, prior to when we did this analysis in 2019. Um, if we took that data and just extrapolated it out to see, you know, at the same rate of EV purchasing going forward, how many EVs would we have in Somerville? And by 2050, we'd have about 30% of the total vehicle fleet in Somerville. So all the cars driving in Somerville would be electric. 
this is a really conservative estimate because it doesn't include any of the new models that are coming online. So you may have heard about like commitments made by GM and Volvo um, and big manufacturers about, um, about new EV models that they'll be releasing. Um, so we expect the price and like popularity of EVs to just grow. So that's probably our most conservative estimate. Then we wanna understand, okay, what is, what rate do we need to be going at if we want to achieve carbon neutrality and net zero emissions by 2050? And that looks like 100% of the cars driving around Somerville are electric. Um, and because you know folks hold on to their cars for many years, um, the transition needs to happen faster for us to reach that 100% point by 2050. So, whoops, sorry. I moved my mouse and everything went away. Okay. <laughs> um, so we then use this data to plug it into a tool that helps us estimate how many uh, charging stations we need. Um, and I just want you to focus on the third row here, public level two EVSE plugs. So in the low scenario with about, you know, where we're on track to have 30% of our vehicles um, electric by 2050, we would need 84 plugs by 2025. So in the next four years, we have uh, like 16 plugs currently. So we're very, you know, there's a lot more that we need to be doing here. In that high scenario, this could be as many as 276 plugs. So just think about that for a second. Where would we fit all of those in Somerville? What does that look like? This is a big transformation um, and requires a lot of infrastructure and planning to think about um, and to prepare for this transformation because it's basically adding a whole new um, you know, system to our, our streets and our homes and all of that. Um, so let's see, I was gonna say one more thing and that slipped my mind. So I'm just gonna move on. But basically the takeaway here is we have to build a lot more um, public charging infrastructure. And this is what I was going to say, came back to me, um, is that this, these numbers would look really different in another community. They're really high because we have, we assumed um, a very low percentage of, uh, of residents being able to charge their cars at home due to our high number of multifamily housing, our limited access to driveways, and our high number of renters. So I just wanted to flag that. Okay, so what does this mean for the city? Um, Currently, our charging are we do not charge a fee to be able to access the charging stations. So the city is paying for the electricity. And as we think about expanding, the costs of electricity and maintenance grow. Um, and so, just based on the those low and high scenarios that I shared, um, the city could be, um, you know, if we continue to not charge a fee for the the charging that it could be anywhere between $100,000 a year in electricity costs to you know, $1.7 million. So really a lot of, um, this is a big investment. So some of the things that we're thinking about going forward is how do we make this more sustainable as we grow this network um, for the city? And one important thing is that, you know, we, we did a lot of research and talked to a lot of companies um, and trying to understand kind of, is there a market for public EV charging? And the reality is it's really hard to make money from public charging, um, especially in the way we want it done, where it's not incentivizing um, traffic into our commercial areas, where it's really serving those who don't have another option um, so serving those renters and in residential areas and things like that. So we need to get creative and, and um, our partners, you know, across the country and like all sorts of cities are trying to think about this too, is what does it look like to expand public charging? Um, so this is a really new area that planners are working on. So we did, um, we kind of set ourselves up to, we developed a strategy that kind of helps us think through some of these decisions. So there are three main categories that we focused on. So first is, you know, infrastructure installation decisions. Where do we want to site them? 
charging stations. What kind of hardware makes sense? Are there cheaper options than what we have now? One thing we're exploring and um, Melrose has piloted is installing charging stations like small, more nimble stations onto street poles. So um, light poles and other utility poles so that they don't take up as much of a footprint. And we think that's a really exciting idea for a dense city like Somerville, if we can get um, you know, more outlets and charging accessibility uh, without having to take up that physical space could be a game changer. Um, so thinking about how do we, how do we site um, our charging stations once they're there, you know, um, because it's making an investment in that infrastructure, you know, what does that mean for the longevity of that parking space going forward? And do we want to have parking in that space for um, an extended period of time? So this gets back to kind of what Brad was talking about. What is the best use of our public space? You know, is it moving people? Is it charging vehicles? These are all really big questions that this, um, that thinking about the transition to EVs really introduces. So the second category of things that we're considering are around pricing decisions. So I said that before that, you know, currently it's free to charge your car on the public stations. That's pretty atypical. Most cities do charge a fee and it's something that we're exploring. Um, so, you know, what sort of revenue structures could we set up? Are there ways to incentivize, use a fee to incentivize the types of behavior we wanna see? What's an acceptable cost to a user? Um, while we want to be incentivizing this, you know, choosing an EV over a, a gas powered vehicle. These are all the types of things that we're considering. And then, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit, but you know, what are the supporting policies that go into this? Um, the city is working on a parking strategy right now. So kind of doing a lot of um, data analysis and collection around parking in the city. That's really impactful for um, what we're going to be doing around electric vehicles. Um, because they're still cars. We still need to store them. They cause traffic. Um, so what are kind of our values around that? And what does the investment look like? And how does it fit in with all these other policies? Um, so that, so um, just going back for a second. So, so we did, uh, we have a whole study that kind of outlines all these questions and considerations. Um, and we wrap that up right at the end of the, um, right last spring. So right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we have a lot of this in place, but we haven't necessarily acted on it um, due to the kind of constraints of this year. But we're really hopeful that with this foundation and kind of thinking about EVs holistically in um, all of our planning decisions and, and um, with mobility that we can um, really like move forward and start to build out a program um, in the coming years. And then finally, I just wanted to like end on this note that we did put together, one of the things we did this year was put together a guide for um, how to install EV charging safely at home. Um, so while I talked a lot about folks who don't have a driveway or who aren't able to charge at home, we do recognize that this does apply to many people in Somerville. Um, and we wanna make sure it's as easy as possible so that if you do have an off street parking spot and you could charge at home, that we're really making it transparent and easy to navigate that process. Um, and so this is just, you know, a, this guide um, gives you a few tips and, and um, direction on how to get this process started and things to consider, like do you want level one charging or level two and how to do that and what electrical upgrades you might need to consider in your home. So um, I will share that resource around um, we're getting it up online right now, so I don't have a URL today, but hopefully next week. Um, and that was, that's all I wanted to share. I know we covered a lot um, and I see questions coming in the Q&A. So I am going to switch over to that. Um, great. Okay, so um, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat. Um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. If you want to try raising your hand, I think I figured out how to unmute people if you want to ask your question in person, but I'm going to start reading through the questions in the chat. And we have this great panel of Brad from the mobility team and then Batal who does a lot of our EV work and Oliver also to chime in with to help with answers. So, um, 
let me see. Okay, so the first question that I'm seeing is, is there any consideration to incentivize landlords to install level one or level two chargers? So we don't have a process necessarily to incentivize landlords for to do this, um, like financially or any way like that. But, um, you know, I think the incentive is that more renters are looking for this, right? So, um, you know, even on Craigslist, now you can choose uh, EV charging as an option that you select. So I think that is kind of how, you know, changing the market and what people are looking for. It's, a, it's an incentive, right, um, to be able to offer that to your tenants, um, but we don't have a program like a, where we'd be able to offer a financial incentive right now. Um, okay, Brad, are you there? Because I'm seeing a couple questions for you. Yes, Anna, I'm just getting, I, I responded to a couple of them. Hopefully that is helpful. And um, I don't want to cut my last answer off to Robert asking about bike parking. I will send that and then answer verbally as best I can with your next question. Great. Um, so this question is, you had data gathered to show the benefit of bus lanes on ridership. Do you have a way to gather that sort of data for bike lanes? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yes, we do, but it's complicated. The city of Somerville has been using a volunteer and staff driven data collection program for the past 10 years, which is super fun. Every fall, we go to 40 different intersections around the city and we collect data on people biking. And it's really cool. Um, and anybody who wants to be involved, if you email transportation at somervillema.gov, it's a group email that goes to me and my four terrific staff, and we'll get back to you on any of these issues. With the Bike Counts program, what we do is we go out and we count over and over at the same locations to look for trend lines. And although we don't generally see like real aha moments about direct relationships between adding a protected or a comfortable bike facility and then seeing an immediate spike in usage the following year, um, that's kind of what the research shows us ought to be happening. The downside of our volunteer driven data collection is that, you know, we essentially give people uh, a three day window or a six day window to try to have representative data. And if it's a rainy day, your numbers are going to be deflated. If there's a construction project, your numbers might be skewed that season. So you can find some of this data uh, on the city's uh, transportation uh, uh, website. If you Google Somerville Mobility Division, you can see some of our analytics and you can get plugged in for our volunteer counts this fall. The other thing I want to call your attention to is that we actually are starting to evaluate demographics. So we try to characterize age, gender, race, and ethnicity um, for our riders. Because again, um, facilities that serve one group of users may not serve the other group of users quite well. Women on bikes are often viewed as an indicator species if you want to use the biology or the ecology term. And often when you find more women walking or biking, uh, that's a great signal that you have a safe and inviting walking and biking environment. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, but, but yeah, in, in summary, we collect data. Uh, we don't always see kind of the same level of rigor that we have with those automated passenger counters that we have on MBTA buses. But our hypothesis, again, remains, if you build it, they will come. So I'm going to ask this one because it's a follow-up question to that. Is Have you considered other sources of bike data, like streetlight data or Strava for crowdsourced bike counts? Wow. Industry expert. Yes, those are two um, uh, data platforms um, that disproportionately use cell phone data or dedicated apps that people subscribe to and then use GP tra GPS trackers on phones to start to understand travel patterns. And interestingly, I was just in a meeting earlier today, we were looking at some Strava data that the city commissioned back in 2016 or 2017. And we were talking about re-upping that because it was so useful a few years ago for some planning work we were doing in our Union Square neighborhood. So yes, the quick summary is there are a variety of technical tools in addition to that sweat equity and boots on the ground I described with our volunteer counts and that can control for and mitigate some of the limitations of those weather and construction and other kind of vagaries uh, with our volunteer driven program. Um, so again, a bunch of our studies are online, you can find them. And um, 
Again, email me if you really want to get more plugged in. We have a great network of local activists. The Somerville Bicycle Advisory Committee is the city's official formal advisory committee. They're actually meeting as we speak, and several of my staff are there at their meeting right now. We have a grassroots group called Somerville Bike Safety uh, that is bringing more and diverse voices into the conversation about planning and managing streets for all. Uh, so there's a million different ways to kind of chase these threads down, and I appreciate that question. Great, thanks for that. And I will, um, maybe I'll follow up with you, Brad, to get some of those like listservs of emails so that people can sign up if they're interested and share those with the ambassadors. Um, so these questions are related um, also for Brad. Are you planning for car-free zones and are you considering having um, hours for certain streets to just be pedestrian and bike only? This is a great group, Hannah. Thanks everybody. Um, <laughs> So I hope that you all saw and appreciated what we tried to do last year as a public health measure in response to the COVID-19 crisis with our citywide shared streets program. That was a version of what's being described in this question, Hannah. So what we did was saw horses, signs, and low cost traffic calming measures, those little movable bollards, uh, those, those little plastic delineators that force motor vehicle operators to slow down, to swerve, and really normalize walking and biking in the street. When we talk to old timers, folks who've been around longer than the 14 years that I have, they say, look, Somerville streets used to be our common space, our shared front yard, the street hockey games, the dog walking, the neighbors talking with neighbors. That culture disappeared a little bit over the last couple of decades. And it disappeared because we overemphasize driving in this society, in this region, and even in this city. The Shared Streets program that we used last year was a real deliberate attempt to begin taking back these streets uh, for free range and community life. Somerville's just four square miles. One of those square miles is streets. We've got to do better. We've got to do better. We don't have enough open space. We don't have enough affordable housing. We don't have enough uh, workforce development opportunities. And repurposing street space can help with all of those objectives. Another example handed to the question is hopefully folks uh, you know, enjoyed our Elm Street and Bow Street shared streets program last year for outdoor dining. We did that everywhere in the city so that any mom and pop merchant or restaurant operator had the ability to bring outdoor dining in a safe COVID compliant fashion. Um, and you know, it was amazing how people responded in Somerville regionally and nationally to the opportunity for alfresco dining by reclaiming street space. Elm Street was our biggest and boldest effort where folks who know Davis well might remember, we used to have two motor vehicle lanes moving from Davis over towards Grove Street and Cutter Avenue and Porter Square. And what we did last year was that we eliminated one of those travel lanes and we gave the residual space to restaurateurs, uh, wider sidewalks for circulation and queuing for retailers, and street seating for our restaurants. And by overwhelming demand, that motor vehicle traveling is not being given back to motorists. It's going to stay people space. Uh, and we're gonna ultimately try to build out that long-term future of Elm Street, whether it becomes like, uh, you know, examples of the pedestrian malls. I've lived for many years in Burlington, Vermont, and Church Street is one of uh, the nation's preeminent examples of this. Uh, Boulder, Colorado has Pearl Street that may fo folks may know. Um, these streets allow for loading. They allow for time limited access for service. Um, and in some cases, you can allow buses. Downtown Crossing in Boston has a version of this. And is that part of the future for Elm Street? You can help us advocate. Google Davis Square Neighborhood Plan. City of Somerville has published a plan uh, with great community participation over a period of years. And it calls for exactly that type of design treatment. Google Union Square Plaza and Streetscape Plan. We're just kicking off the next generation of planning in Union Square, where we intend to reclaim street space, including on Bow Street, for people, for civics, for dining. Um, and uh, this stuff just doesn't happen without people like you asking and demanding more from people like us. So I hope that question and that answer is helpful. Definitely helpful. And someone in the chat even chiming in saying, changes to Davis Square were great, um, seeing all that outdoor dining. Um, Okay, so uh, switching gears to EVs for a second. Um, maybe Oliver Rattal, you could answer this. Um, there were stories going around of gas stations starting to transition into EV charging stations. Is Somerville talking to third parties like this to increase the amount of publicly accessible infrastructure? 
Yes, so I will try to um, give a coherent answer, but the reason it's kind of hard is also the reason this is kind of a fun time, which is that it's like a bit of the wild west, right? Like there's no one knows where technology, funding, consumer trends are gonna go and there's lots of different scenarios. And what we do know is that there are, uh, there are gonna be changes and there's gonna be things that pop up and become obsolete. That's already happening. Um, but what I will say is that um, <clears throat> I think we probably will see across the country get some gas stations try to you know convert to EV charging. But we really, I think largely are going to be seeing EV charging as a, an activity that is very different from like fueling up a vehicle the way we do it now. Because as Hannah mentioned, most charging is going to happen at home. And even if that's made very complicated by uh, our dense urban environment, maybe at home can be substituted with while parked. So I really think we're gonna be seeing charging as, an, as something that happens when your car is parked because that is when you have electricity that is just you know the same rate pretty much as what you're using in your lights at home. Um, and you know electrified parking is probably something we're gonna see a lot more of. And fast charging, which is what would maybe make sense in a um, sort of gas station-like environment, well, that actually addresses more of like the range anxiety issues. So you'll like, you'll be seeing those maybe along highway corridors or in places where real estate is not that expensive and, it, and, and where someone who's on a road trip is gonna need to pull over. But in a dense urban area like this, there's gonna be much less of a need for, um, you know, a quick full charge um, because most people are going to be parking and charging because it's cheaper. Um, so I would say that, you know, we have been talking a lot to, to fast charging providers who would be maybe not at gas stations, but doing something like gas stations and they're, you know, I, they're reflecting what we see, which is that, you know, the business case isn't totally there and they don't really, you know, they, they want to come in because it increases visibility, but it's, you know, not gonna be the catalyzing force for, a lot of like movement in, in new customers. So, you know, like I said, not a totally coherent answer, but I think <laughs> we're talking to them. We might see some things happen. It should be noted that there will, because of zoning, there will be no new gas stations in Somerville anyway. So what you will see will be uh, electric vehicle recharging stations, which is what it's called in the new zoning. And those could be anywhere, not necessarily where gas stations are now. So that real estate might be worth <laughs> something different. So it's, uh, there's a lot of things at play here. <clears throat> yeah, and I think the one thing I'll add kind of to that last point is um, thinking about like the <laughs> like highest and best use of land. Um, so, you know, Brad mentioned how much space is dedicated to, to driving and parking in streets. Um, you know, I think it's unlikely that we'll see in dense cities like Somerville um, that it makes economic sense to develop, you know, redevelop a gas station to just have charging rather than redeveloping it into, you know, a mixed use building or something like that. Um, so that, you know, contributes to like, we're probably just going to see a shift that like completely changes, you know, how we're driving and like refueling our, our vehicles um, and where that happens and what it looks like. Um, so I see a couple more questions that I will get to. Um, for fast chargers, can Somerville decide the source of the electricity? Could the city opt for 100% renewable sources? So um, I'm gonna try to answer this and Vital, feel free to add in anything. Um, so basically, we don't have any fast chargers, so we'll just answer this with public chargers, which are our level two stations. Those have to, we have to hook them up to a source of electricity. Um, so the easiest way to do that is um, connecting them to existing um, boxes. So like if you're electrical boxes that you'll see around the city. So like they're near traffic control boxes typically. So like near um, traffic lights, um, that's the sort of thing that's easiest to hook a station up to. 
um, because you need a source for the electricity. The other option is that we're we're interested in exploring, and some cities have done this, is connecting them to like street lights, because um, that's another source of electricity. Um, so you really need to find that infrastructure piece is critical. Um, and basically, we pay the city pays the bills for those uh, for those that that electricity. And so if we were buying, you know, recs and 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 in that way, so renewable energy credits, we could be getting that from 100% renewable sources. Um, we're not there yet, but that's definitely kind of a, a path forward. Um, so I don't know if anyone else on the line wants to add anything to that. Um, while I look at other questions. That's good. Um, I can just oh, give one, one piece of information. Basically, uh, for fast charging, uh, the re requirement of uh, power is far different than what we have already on the street. Uh, it's like a 440 volt uh, cabinet uh, box we need uh, for fast charging. And to install it and to use it uh, needs a lot of, uh, obviously cost, in, it, uh, there is a lot of initial cost. And additionally, not necessarily maximum available electric vehicles right now are can use the fast charging. So that's another challenge also. So there are several things. Yeah, definitely good point about the fast charging. Oh, go ahead, Brad. Hannah, can I chime in a tiny bit here? Um, another yeah. interesting thing here is folks should really keep in mind the role of private real estate development in all of these issues, right? Private real estate development has the potential to advance our community goals or to undermine them. And fortunately, we've got a really thoughtful group of residents. We've got a really thoughtful group of staff who really work to try to accentuate the positive and minimize the negative. Parking is something that the private development market always wants to provide and we always try to push back against. And so to this point about EV charging infrastructure, if folks are interested in land use and densification without driving, um, we should be trying to make sure that when new private development comes to Somerville, the limited private parking that is provided is only for electric and shared vehicles. I think that would be a forcing function that starts to break the bad habit of petroleum addiction in our community. That's a great point and an excellent segue to the next question that just came in. And I know we're, we're just over seven, so I want to be cognizant of people's time, but I think we'll take, you know, a, we'll, uh, five more minutes to answer these questions, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so this question is, do we know how many residents do not own cars at all? And is there a hope, especially with the Green Line extension, that more households will become carless? And I think this, to Brad's point, um, there's a lot in our zoning um, that was passed the end of 2019. Um, <laughs> can't keep track of years these days. Um, that where we have created parking, um, gotten rid of parking minimums. So you can build in a transit area, uh, apartment building with no parking at all. Um, and so that is really kind of trying to incentivize and have the private um, development market help align with our transportation goals and, and making it so it's easy um, to, you know, to access that transit and it's less easy to own a car and store it and keep it um, in Somerville. So Brad, I don't know if there's more you want to add to that. For easy rule of thumb folks, 25% of our households, one, of, one out of four of our neighbors are car free households. Um, and so transportation is an equity issue, right? When we actually systematically advantage walking, biking and transit, um, we are serving an underserved population in our society, in our community. Um, Somerville is one of the least car dependent communities in America. When you actually look at census data, um, we stack up really, really well against, honestly, like the New York cities and the Jersey cities. Um, when you look at percentage of people who primarily use walking, biking, and mass transit, um, we're a regional leader. It's something like uh, 35, 38% of our residents report that their dominant commute mode is mass transit. Uh, something like 10 or 11% is walking or wheeling. Something like 7 or 8% is bike riding. Our adopted plans do call on us to really accentuate that progress and then push those numbers even higher. Uh, so hopefully that gets a little bit to that question. Great, thank you. 
Um, okay, so I think the last question that I'm seeing um, is if we have data on how much the current EV chargers are being used and along with pricing, are there ways to schedule charging use so more than one car could get charged in a day? So just to add some more clarification to that question, more than one charge car is getting charged in a day on our chargers already. We have a three hour limit on all of the chargers or most of them. Um, so, so folks shouldn't be leaving their cars charged, you know, sitting there and charging all day. Um, and you do, while well, you don't have to pay for charging, you do have to pay for parking. So that's one way that we um, kind of incentivize people to move over as well. Um, we do have data on, we have a whole dashboard of data on the charging that, so it's actually really great. We get information on, you know, where, where folks are coming from, you know, their zip code, um, how long they're charging for, things like that. Um, so we do have data on that. And that's how we know that over a thousand different users used our charging stations in 2020. Um, and this question is also getting at something that we're thinking a lot about too, of, you know, we're, we currently have charge point stations, um, but there are a lot of different companies that create charging stations and offer different features. And there are things you can add on. So some stations do offer like a queuing feature so you can make a reservation or get in line to get the station once it's available. Because we know that, you know, the challenge with public charging is that it's um, historically kind of been treated as something you do to supplement your charging at home. And in Somerville, if we're thinking about our public charging serving as that residential charging, so it has to be reliable enough that people can count on it so that if they, you know, that they can plan their trips and how to use that car for what, what they need. Um, so thinking about those different technological features is something that we're really, we're trying to stay on top of too. And as Oliver said, this is changing constantly. You know, the technology is evolving every day. Um, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's also hard to think about, you know, what do we want to be making an investment in um, with our very limited public dollars? Um, kind of knowing that the city, you know, is the right now um, kind of the only one who's willing to make those investments in the residential charging that is publicly accessible. Um, okay, so I think those were all of the questions. Did it look like I'd miss any to Oliver Batal? Did you see any that came in? I think I got them all. Um, so if to the ambassadors, um, if you have more questions, we will have plenty of time to talk about this um, at our next meeting in two weeks. Um, so keep thinking about this and we'll come back and have lots of opportunity to discuss and ask more questions. Um, and I wanna just thank our uh, panelists for being here tonight. So thank you to Brad for um, presenting and sharing all your information. And thanks for Oliver and Vital for joining. And I hope you all have a great evening and see many of you in the next couple of weeks. So. Good night. Good night. Thank you.